Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to 10x the power of your intentions, then do we have the Power of Eight show for you. Today I'll be talking with Lynn McTaggart, the award-winning journalist and best-selling author of at least seven books, including The Field, The Intention Experiment, The Bond, and an earth-shattering, paradigm-busting book on creating miracles, The Power of Eight. And that's just what I want to talk with her about today, about how you use the power of group intention to radically shift your life, your health, and your world. That plus we'll talk about the power of time travel, Ecclesia and the Bible, Unio Mystica, small steps, Ellie, what on earth is the Woodstock effect, and what in the world Homo Thumadon has to do with anything. Gotcha. So welcome back to the show, Lynn. Are you ready to shine? Thank you so much, Michael. It's great to be here with you again. It is so, I'm so, so excited. I'm like, okay, honestly, I'm like a kid in the candy store because what you're doing is changing the world quite literally. And we have the power to change the world quite literally. So I'm super excited. So before I'm going to take a deep breath, I'm so excited. But before we dive right into things, do we really have the power to manifest miracles? We unquestionably have the power to uh, manifest miracles. You know, we know this as small children. We see it, we feel it, but it's talked out of us. You know, we're discouraged from believing this from our authority figures and sometimes our parents or our teachers, but primarily through modern science. Modern science tells us that we're just a batch of electricity and chemical signals. And so we come to believe that. We believe that we are powerless and that we need to place our power in the hands of other people, particularly healers, doctors, all of that. When we have the power to heal ourselves from the gravest kinds of illnesses, in fact, to heal other aspects of our lives, whether it's our career, our finances, our relationships, even our life's journey. And I've seen it thousands and thousands of times. And remember, Michael, I come at this as a hard-nosed investigative reporter. So I started out as a skeptic, and I've become a true believer, but also because there's plenty of evidence to prove it. Well, it's interesting, and thank you for sharing. It's, it's interesting because you said that modern science, and I almost want to put that in, put that in quotes because we can look at uh, Dean Radin and on and on and on it goes of science, actually uh, Edgar Mitch Mitchell and the uh, Noetic Center for Science. And we can go back actually close to a century and there is actually hard-nosed science that backs up what you're saying, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there. this is not new. Um, we have known that things that they call the observer effect, the idea that mind influences matter, um, was understood over 100 years ago. And certainly with the advent of quantum physics, that really changed everything. And even the studies and the fr so-called frontier scientists that I've been most interested in, they were working in the 1970s. So what we're talking about here is history. But, you know, it, as they say in science, it precedes one funeral at a time, Michael. And so even though this is old news in lots of ways, um, we are still operating according to the paradigms the scientific paradigms of hundreds of years ago, Newton Newtonian science, Darwinian science. So we are left with this idea that we are static, self-contained, separate entities operating according to fixed laws in time and space. And so we're little separate billiard balls operating on this lonely little planet in a lonely little universe. And that is not the science that is coming to the fore. The new science is showing an unbelievable, powerful interconnection and human potential beyond which we have, uh, we've been unable to dream. We have the ability to do so many things we it, haven't dreamed of. Let's, let's talk about that. Actually, I, I wanna back up for one brief second and I wanna pick on two, two really cool dudes, Newton and Darwin. 
Darwin was considered insane toward the end of his life because he was trying to actually explain what he really meant and people were cherry picking his ideas. Newton is one of the most spiritual dudes you ever would have met, but we cherry picked this idea of materialism. It's all wrong. That's what the new science is showing. What is exciting you most that you're seeing? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, Newton was a mystic. And Darwin came to believe that life proceeds through cooperation, not struggle, not competition. But he never actually even coined the term survival of the fittest. His, you know, his mate did. And he was essentially his mouthpiece and a bulldog and, and projected this. And that became potentially a justifying principle for so many things, the rise of industrial capitalism, and um, even, you know, Hitler loved Darwin because it justified, you know, taking over lesser, um, lesser countries, lesser communities and populations in his mind. Um, and colonialism came from it. So as you say, it was based on essentially a faulty understanding and a cherry picking of what they did. What excites me most now, of course, um, the newest science showing that, you know, what I wrote about 20 years ago, the field and the idea that, you know, quantum physics and the zero point field exists, that there is a quantum energy field out there is definitely being demonstrated in the science. It's almost without question now. That excites me, but probably even more what I've observed with my own scientific experiments and with the work that I do with the power of A. The fact that a small or large group intending together supersizes its effect. So yes, individually, mind can affect matter, can create, you can create your own miracles, but they get exponentially um, powered through the intention of a small group. Thank you. I want to dive into that more. I'm, 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 I'm working with a few very high-level individuals, and Dr. Irvin Laszlo, been nominated, he's been nominated for two Nobel Peace Prizes, and he's just an amazing individual. And we're working on a white paper that's going to be presented at a symposium, then presented to the UN on a different way on structuring this planet of how we come together in one with consciousness rather than saying consciousness is separate. And what you're describing is a new way of beingness. So there is talking about individual intention, there's talking about group intention, and then there is, I believe, talking about living in a state of group intention. And now I'm seeing humanity, I'm really diving off track, but on track, humanity like an electron jumping to an elect new electron state as we all learn how to come into unison, into harmony, vibrating in frequency as one. Oh, absolutely. And you know, I've seen this not only in our small power of eight groups, Michael, but I run this thing called the intention experiment and I've been running it since 2007. Really, it started from skepticism, you know. I mean, seeing all these scientific um, studies and papers um, that say mind is an actual something with the capacity to change physical matter. So the journalist in me said, well, how far can we take this? You know, are we talking about some tiny little effect or are we talking about curing cancer with your thoughts? So I started out working with scientists who had themselves done consciousness research in places like Princeton and um, Penn State and University of Arizona and elsewhere, University of California, and we set up periodic experiments, um, trying to make seeds grow faster or purifying water. And to do so, I invited my uh, audience, an actual audience I had if I was speaking somewhere, or my internet audience, my readership, to come on all at the same time and set a big intention. And you know, we've done 36 experiments to date and 30 two have shown measurable, positive, mostly significant effects. And the ones that didn't work were really down, in most cases, to a faulty study design or some technical issue. So, you know, everything from the seeds in the water to lowering violence in war-torn areas to even healing someone of uh, a, an illness, a mental illness. But 
that wasn't the interesting part of the story for me. The most interesting part of the story for me was what was happening to the people participating. The very act of participation was the most important change. We we saw extraordinary changes. We did an experiment in, uh, in 2017 to lower violence in the most violent place in America, which is um, a, a portion, a little part of St. Louis, Missouri. I, I, to interrupt, I participated in that. I was on the, the call or whatever and, and, and did this, and I was so excited, and I didn't find out the results, but I was so excited to be able to participate in this with you. This is, people have blown up servers to be a part of these studies for good reason. It felt great. That's absolutely right, Michael. And by the way, the result was just that little neighborhood had a lowering of violence of 43% that persisted over mm-hmm. six months after, right, and happened right after our experiment. All the surrounding areas of St. Louis as a whole and the surrounding neighborhoods did not have that lowering of violence. It stayed steady. But as you say, I, I survey participants, and I have done since 2008, to find out if anything changed for them. And I did it really just to find out if they could get on our websites. And I started discovering that they themselves were changing, that they were finding more peace in their lives, that they were writing me back in the thousands. Uh, I felt like I was part of a higher network. You know, they were describing major physical changes during it. You know, I felt like I was in the tractor beam of Star Trek. I'm getting along better with my estranged sister. I've made up with my partner. My boss and I, it's like night and day. We're suddenly getting along really well. I love my coworkers. And most of all, I'm more in love with everyone I come in contact with. About half of all people say that. So I put that to a really big test a couple of years ago. I was fortunate enough to work in a studio that had the ability to beam into nine different locations. So we put cameras, working with a a guy I know called Dr. Salah al-Rashid, who is like the Deepak of the Middle East. We put cameras in eight different um, conference rooms in eight different Arab cities. Mm -hmm. And the ninth camera was put in an uh, audience filled with an auditorium filled with Israeli Jews. So we had Arabs and Jews there together. You now, rock, to set Lynn. up this experiment, <laughs> they were barely speaking to each other. You know, I had to be the intermediary all the time. So we did an intention to lower violence in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And afterward, because of the technology, I could speak to them, they could speak to me and each other. And they started saying things like, your God is my God, the Arabs said to the Israelis. The Israelis started saying, we love you, brothers and sisters. And they were all coming together and everybody was crying. It was extraordinary. And um, so it's that that I think is the is the piece. It the target is almost irrelevant. It's the act of coming together and doing what is like a secular prayer that heals the healer. Let's dive into this. And there's so many different directions I can go. I'm thinking one of the concept of a laser beam. I'm thinking another of of Paul Selig, an an amazing amazing, uh, channel medium guide who has a whole series of books on I Am the Word and going to the upper room. It seems like if I am understanding this right, and, and I've read your work many times, as we bring like I have all these lights around me that have diffuse focus. If we took all of the 10,000 watts or so that are beaming on me, I guess less with LEDs these days, and we focused it to the the head of a needle, it'd be called a laser, and it would burn through steel. I wouldn't be here anymore if we focused it. When we take people's intention and bring a sharp focus to it, whatever that is, All of a sudden, we are in attunement or accord. Not only does something pop on the other side, everybody begins to pop because they're all in frequency. It's like Boy Scouts going across a bridge, marching together. The bridge, steel and cement collapses because they hit just the right frequency. I think that's such an interesting way of describing it, Michael, and that absolutely is it. Um, When you think about 
um, when they say coherence, when they use the term coherence in science, um, that's used very loosely now, but it's, it's an actual word in physics, and it means different waves that are all um, waving at exactly the same amplitude. So usually you've got waves and they're doing this, you know, they're waving um, all in essentially against each other or waving their own way. When you have waves that are coherent, they start operating in total synchrony like that, and it starts becoming one giant wave. And the, uh, the power gets increased hugely, exponentially. So think of a light bulb. A light bulb has a lot of discordant energy, a lot of uh, non-coherent energy. But if you were to make all of that, all of that, those light rays and make them coherent, you would have something that shined, shined millions of times more than the sun. So as you say, it's like a laser. So yes, in a way we are coming together. Now I've done, uh, I worked with Life University. I was very lucky they put their neuroscience department at my disposal because they were really interested in what's going on with these power bait groups. So we recruited seven sets of students and we put an EEG cap on one of each of the, uh, the members of each group. To, and they were all senders. We had them send intention to a member of the group with a health challenge. And we found that very quickly, even though these guys were total novices at, at intention work, power of being group work, the parts of the brain that make us feel separate and alone Maybe here, the parietal lobes, they help us navigate through space. They tell us, this is me, this is not me. They were turned way down. And so were the parts of the brain, like the right frontal lobes, involved with worry, doubt, negativity, those kinds of emotions. They were also dialed way down. Other parts were too, but essentially, these were brainwave signatures almost identical to those of a Buddhist monk, in ecstatic prayer, a Sufi master during chanting. So they looked nothing like meditation, which shocked us. They looked everything like somebody in a state of ecstatic oneness. And I think that's really the secret sauce here, Michael, is we leave our own sense of corporeal separateness and enter our true state. We experience our true state, which is a state of oneness. I've got to bring up this. This is our book that's coming out about the same time as your program here called Awe, The Automatic Writing Experience. And we interviewed Dr. Andrew Newberg, who you have in your books as well. And we're talking to him about just this state and what happens in automatic writing. To me, my concept of it is we plug in with that Akashic field. We plug in with the field. We get in vibrational alignment, frontal lobe powers down, parietal lobe powers down. We have this union mystica. We're at one with everything, which which is what you're describing. And now you're taking it one step further and saying, when we do this in resonance as a group, people begin to pop. Absolutely. And I think there's lots going on here, Michael, in, in terms of the power of eight groups. And that's so interesting about automatic writing. And you're right, unio mystico, you know, that holy instant, as uh, The Course in Miracles calls it, that, that thing that mystics have been chasing for centuries. The extraordinary thing about it is, it usually takes years of disciplined practice to get there, or you know, hours of priming to get there. And as I say, the students who were doing these power of eight groups, they were total novices. They hadn't even meditated before. And yet, within a few minutes, they were in this state. And so, when I talk about what happens, I think there's lots of reasons why this causes these miracles, why power of eight groups cause the miracles. There is that unified field effect that we have, that feeling of oneness. And that's the thing. I think when people reach that state, that's when a miracle occurs. And I'll tell you about one in a moment. Um, there is also the group effect, you know, groups cause what they call a collective effervescence, as Emile Durkheim, the famous French psychologist put it, you know, we get all jazzed up in a group. But also a big piece of this is altruism. 
when you study the science of altruism, it shows one of the things about a power of eight group is that you have to give as well as receive. Sometimes it's your turn, sometimes you're the sender. And when I started looking into the science of altruism, I found that people who give in any capacity live longer, healthier, happier lives. And that is over and over again what I hear in Power of Eight groups. It almost doesn't matter if they're the receiver or not, they get healed. One of the most miraculous cases of this occurred a year ago in one of the last in-person talks I gave before all of the shutdown. Um, I was in an auditorium with 700 people in the audience. And as I usually do, after the end of a talk, I put people in power of eight groups. And I had them send healing intention to a member of the group with a health challenge. And then I usually ask people at the end, so did anyone feel anything? Anybody have anything to talk about? So everybody, stood, you know, the people who had received the, the intention, you know, told all kinds of wonderful stories about ending pain, et cetera. And then the last person, and I have this on video, it's so extraordinary. Um, <clears throat> The last person, uh, it was her group who said you should speak, was Maya. Now, Maya was there in the front of the audience in a motorized wheelchair. Young woman who was paralyzed from the neck down that year from some weird idiopathic something, meaning the doctors didn't know why. And so they said, you go ahead and talk. And they tried to help her up because everybody was standing up when they talked. And she just got up by herself. Now, this is somebody who was paralyzed from the neck down. So we're all there with our jaws on the floor. And she says, you know, I don't need your help. And she said, I'm standing. I'm standing. And it was extraordinary. And I, I, was, so extra I was so amazed by it all that I, I caught up with her afterward and called her and said, Maya, what did that feel like? And she said, well... It felt like more love than I had ever known, ever. And it felt like almost too much. So I thought, I don't need all of this, and I passed it on. So she passed on some of that love to a relative of hers who had cancer. And it was weird, she said, at that moment, it felt like the wheel, wheels of her wheelchair fell through the floor. Now I have these both these videos on Facebook if anyone wants to look at them. Um, I just found that encapsulates what seems to happen over and over again. Thank you. B beyond thank you, because Jessica and I, my wife Jessica and I, we do uh, prayer work, angel work each morning, and we talk about passing on this energy. Please give back this energy. Please, as we are charged up, may this energy pass on to those in need. What you're saying here now is so powerful that more important, and I'm going to get back to our own specific intentions, more important than helping ourselves by helping ourselves is energetically helping ourselves by passing that on to others. And it has a boomerang effect to it. Oh, it has a total boomerang effect, Michael, and that's exactly it. Um, <clears throat> I run a year-long master class, and I've done so since 2015, where I teach my students a lot about the rudimentaries of intention, using it in you know the 13 keys of, to intention mastery, and using it with relationships and dealing with negativity in intention, your own and everyone else's, and then also how to get into a group. Then I put people into groups in their time zone. And that's the real, that's where the work really begins. And they meet with their group every week for an entire year. And <clears throat> while I monitor what's going on with them, and they have catch up calls with me, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when I first started this, it was really fascinating. I started it in 2015 as an experiment to myself, wanting to find out, well, if I put them in a group for a year, would everything in their lives begin to heal? Because I was seeing all these healings when I was giving talks. But then I wanted to really essentially study this. And I found that of the first 250 who did it, about 150 continued to meet diligently all year. They stayed with it. And of that 150, pretty much 100% of them had extraordinary 
physical, emotional, mental transformations, whether it was their, their, um, their health, their career, their finances, um, their, their relationships, their life's purpose, things in their life totally shifted. But a few of them were getting nowhere. So this is when, this is where it all came about. So I remember batches of them saying, you know, well, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. I remember one woman, Andy Spiros, in that first group, and she was trying to get a job and was very talented, but um, uh, she couldn't get any work, any new work. She had sold her gift store business. She was just going through a divorce, had two small kids, needed money, couldn't find anything. And she, she was a great coach and a talented marketer couldn't find anything. So finally, I just said to her, Andy, get off of yourself. And I had her, I said, look, intend for this young boy, a young boy called Luke, who had tried to commit suicide after breaking up with his first serious girlfriend. And I had the whole master class start sending healing intention to Luke over three successive Sundays because he'd thrown himself off a 40 foot structure and broke everything in his body and survived, the doctors didn't think he was gonna live. So we made that a little project. And the great news is Luke is got out of the hospital in record time. He's now totally healthy, 18 year old. Now, maybe we did this, maybe we didn't. Uh, maybe well, it was but, just but I, I read his story and there were there were pulses. Like I believe it was that he was starting to get better, starting to feel better, and but he wasn't able to feel, if I had it right, his blow, his bowel and his bladder. And he started mm -hmm. to go down into a deep dark hole. Now he had tried to commit suicide at fourteen because of a breakup in a relationship. So that was a very scary thing. You got your power of eight together, zoned in on him, and all of a sudden pating. Absolutely. Every time we did it. Um, and his stepfather kept a running commentary of what was going on. And um, and then he would send it to me. He'd say just around the time we did our intention and afterwards so that we could see if there was any any uh, difference made by our intention. And there always was a big boost to Luke. And as I always like to say, I mean, this wasn't a placebo effect because Luke didn't believe one bit of this. But his parents came to a talk I gave a year ago. Mm -hmm. and they were in the audience and they came up afterward and shared some photos of him and that he is great now, um, which is wonderful. But the point of the story, Michael, is what happened to Andy. As soon as she got off of, some, uh, off of herself and started intending for someone else, Andy gets a call out of nowhere with her dream job. Now that has happened over and over and over again. It happened to Lisa, who was trying to write a, a best-selling book and was getting nowhere. Her group's intention was not helping her. Nothing was working. So I finally said, okay, Lisa, get off of yourself. There's gotta be somebody in your group that has a, a tougher time than you. So she started intending for someone in the group who uh, needed more money, who had financial problems. And out of nowhere, she gets mysteriously compelled to go into a store she doesn't even need anything from. The following week, bumps into a woman she vaguely had knew who had been introduced to her. They start chatting and it turns out, and she feels compelled to talk to this woman. Turns out this woman is a book coach and offers when she hears about Lisa's project, offers to walk her through the whole process and help her market it. And the upshot is the book becomes an Amazon bestseller. So, <laughs> so, but I've seen these, you know, in our current master class, I mean, the extraordinary stories that continue to come through people who have had so much difficulty. Um, I had a woman who, I have a woman who is um, was so sugar addicted that she was binging in the middle of the night so she wouldn't get sleep to sleep. So she would sleep till the afternoon and it was affecting her relationship. She was very overweight, all of those things. And with the group's help and intention, she's given up all sugar successfully now. She's doing exercise, she's doing meditation. Her relationship is fabulous with her husband and she says, this is, I feel more supported 
than I ever have in my life because it's that little cluster of people that you know, people who used to be a stranger who have your back, you know, and that's the most powerful part of it of all, I think. Very, very cool. So I want to, I want to, I want to dive. Thank you for sharing. I want to dive back a little bit. And I'm, 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 this means to meddle when I put my fingers together and I'm meddling and I'm working on coming up with a formula, which I'm sure you already have some sort of formula for intention and getting past your, your blocks, your wounds and negativity, which is potentially we set intention, what we're hoping for. If it is not coming back or coming about, we, we skip worrying about ourselves. We put that laser beam focus on somebody else, preferably in a group, like a, a group of eight or larger. And the subconscious block will most likely, if I'm understanding correctly, take care of itself when the focus is, like you say, get off of yourself, is no longer on ourselves and our block, but is on helping somebody else. Helping is absolutely, Michael. I mean, helping is... And that's the great thing about a power of eight group. You get to you get to receive, you get to give. And more of the time you're giving than receiving. If you've got eight people in the group, and it by the way, it doesn't have to be eight. It works with five, it works with twelve. It just needs a group. But you know, you're focusing on other people sometimes, and that can be so healthy and strengthening. And the science supports it. People who are ill, when they help people with the same illness, they get better quicker. People who get go out of their way, even in a small way, as I say, live longer, healthier, happier lives. And it's also the group effect. People who are the poorest members of America, when they lose their job, they don't suffer depression as long as they have two things, a strong spiritual belief, mm -hmm. and even more important, a strong spiritual community. So it's that community effect, Michael, that is the whole big transformational piece. Do we need to have, I'm thinking back, there was some Harvard study that followed people for their entire lives. And I'm thinking about the, those who were most plugged into others were the ones who stayed healthiest the longest. Do we need to actually, in a power of eight, have an intention, like I'm thinking shamanic ceremony and stuff. You want to set an intention for yourself before you go in. Here, it sounds like the benefits happen to you, even if you're not setting an intention for yourself. Yeah. And, you know, the interesting thing is when I was first researching the power of eight, trying to figure out, well, why does this work? There must be some antecedents here. Yeah. And I was looking at a lot of these indigenous practices and found that almost all the time, you know, circles, prayer circles are nothing new. But almost always they had a guide, a shaman, something like that. With these, it's this little democratic group. Now, you said, what happens if it's not coming true for people? I mean, some of the things that I teach are, number one, a lot of times in, people intend for, you know, a giant-sized uh, three-course meal. And s what I have found works so much better is being very specific. Mm -hmm. You know, number one, most people don't tell the universe what they really want. You know, they'll say stuff like, you know, I want to be rich or I want to find a new man in my life. They don't say, you know, well, what does he look like? What is he like? What is his, you know, what are his interests, whatever? Or with Rich, do you really need a million dollars or $5 million or $20 million? Or is it that you just want to buy a new car or you want to change your job or you need, you know, you need um, more time to be with your children or grandchildren? You know, tell the universe what you want. But what's also worked for us, uh, I just spoke to a woman in my master class uh, yesterday, uh, uh, a husband and wife team both took it. And they both have been, she has osteoporosis or, and, and he had uh, prostate cancer. And what I oftentimes tell people with health issues is do an intention to find the right treatment for you first, then find the right practitioner. Then find then this, then that. Um, we've been working on a friend of ours in my own Power of Eight group who had stage four prostate cancer. Yeah. And now he's very close to being completely healed. Um, and what we've done week by week, we've been doing intentions for him since March. And what we do is first it was 
to be able to tolerate some of the treatments he was getting. Then it was to be able to, without side effects, then it was to lower his PSA count. And we would be very specific. We wanted it to be below five, then we wanted it to be below three, and then we wanted it below two, you know, and we focused on getting rid of any metastases. So, you know, tell the universe exactly what you want and be really specific. The other thing that I work on with people is when you said blocks, is finding those blocks. And we have some intention techniques that help to find the blocks and remove them and just get rid of, get rid of your powerlessness. That's the thing that's key. Would you mind sharing with us, because so many people who listen to the show write in and say, I do my law of attraction work, I do my manifestation work, I do my intention work, and yet, and yet, and yet. So would you have one te technique you wouldn't mind sharing, an intention technique to find that block and move past it? It's, that's a more complicated one to share in a short uh, show. Um, Michael, but I can explain a bit about what I do. I mean, I have to work with people for a while with this, but it's essentially taking back your power. A lot of times people have trauma in some way because they felt powerless. Let's say you were in a class when you were in grade school and your teacher told you you were stupid at math. And that will oftentimes just become your reality you know, that you will just automatically assume as a 40 year old or whatever, that you're pretty hopeless with numbers. And that might have been the case when you were seven, but it's not necessarily the case with 40. So we do a number of techniques to change not what happened, but how you feel about what happened. And it's the powerlessness that's the problem, not what happened, it's your powerlessness. And the techniques I try to share give you your power back. So it's oftentimes that's the root of it. And the other issue with powerlessness and trauma is again, not feeling worthy. And a big one, not feeling worthy. And that's what the group does that's really extraordinary. The fact, as I say, I cannot, I cannot overemphasize the extraordinary personal power that you receive when you've got a group of strangers sending you more love than you may have ever received in your life. I mean, that is extraordinarily strengthening. We have people sobbing. I mean, these are just in my audience. When I have people doing it for the first time, they're sobbing because they haven't felt that kind of love from strangers, possibly from anybody. But to have a group, and then that becomes, if you're meeting regularly with your groups, um, that becomes something that is extraordinarily supportive to you week by week by week. If you have eight people together and we, you haven't gone through your particular program, can eight people focusing on a target, focusing on a cause together, get into a state of meditation is it as simple as that, that it's going to work? Or is there some advanced technique to it? Well, I mean, yeah, there are advanced techniques to it. Um, there's simple enough stuff to start you off. I mean, in my book, I give, in my book, The Power of Eight, I give the rudimentaries of how to do it and how to get together with your group and what to do. And I always say for people, you know, if you can't take a course with me, I've got loads of other things, resources. We have a new community site where you can just put up a little notice saying, hey, anybody in my time zone who wants to set up a Power of Eight group? When the pandemic started, I set up a special Facebook group that anyone is able to join called Connecting and Healing Through the Power of Eight. And people advertise all the time and say, hey, I'm in the Pacific time zone. Anybody want to be uh, in my Power of Eight group or cool. can I join another one? And people go back and forth and back and forth like that. So I have loads of resources for people that are completely free. You can even borrow my book from the library to set up your own Power of Eight group. Thank you. So let's, let's go into a, a few fun, fun ones. What did you do as a large experiment or as a large... I'm going to call it offering service to the world for the inauguration. 
Okay, well, after that Israeli and uh, Arab experiment, uh, and we'd run one more before that with Arabs and Americans on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, and I saw the same thing happen, love being sent back and forth. It started me thinking about ending polarization in the States. So I had ironically planned this experiment for the 20, uh, for the 17th of January of this year, uh, right before the inauguration, but I planned it before January 6th. So it was fascinating that, it, <laughs> that we had it all in place. And what I wanted to do was broadcast a Zoom meeting that I had where I would put on representatives from polarized communities. So I had on there some diehard Republicans yeah. and I had some diehard Democrats and I had a, uh, some African-Americans who had been very sympathetic to Black Lives Matter and I had some representatives of the police and I had a former jihadi. Oh, I love and you, I had, uh, <laughs> I had Someone who believed in, you know, in, in the outer rim of conspiracy theories, you know, with um, with the whole election, et cetera, and on and on and on. And we had somebody who wanted to be involved in, you know, independent political parties and other people who wanted this and that. So we had them all together. And I had them do an intention for a peaceful inauguration together and then had them speak. And it was amazing to see what they had to say to each other. There was such love. There was such connection. There was such uh, heart leaping across the fence. And, you know, I was puzzled by that back in, you know, in, uh, well, 2011 when we did the 10th anniversary one and then of course the Jerusalem experiment till I looked at the work of Dacher Keltner who is a psychologist at the University of California at Berkeley who did ex an experiment with two groups of students one group was shown pictures of the world's victims like starving children the other group was shown pictures designed to elicit pride among students uh, things like the Berkeley campus, um, the, the Berkeley team beating the Stanford football team, and things like that. And afterward, he showed them other pictures. Group A, who'd been shown the world's victims, were more likely to identify with people not like them. You know, whether it was prisoners, if they were Democrats, Republicans, if they were Republicans, yeah. Democrats, um, you know, uh, uh, homeless people, etc. Whereas the other group only identified with people, students like them, or the people they would become, doctors, lawyers, accountants, that kind of thing. So when I talked to him about it, he said, well, this has all to do with the activation of the vagus nerve. The longest nerve in our body, it starts at the neck, it winds through all of the major organs of the body. And when it is activated, not only does it help to, um, uh, to release oxytocin, mm. our, uh, the hormone released when we are compassionate, when we're caring, caretaking, like when we have, you know, with our children, but it also makes us more tolerant of people not like us. And that to me was the key here. Get involved in a compassionate act like group intention and the heart is able to leap across the fence. So that to me was the perfect explanation for why the Jerusalem experiment, and of course, more recently with the inauguration experiment that people who normally hate each other were able to come together. It, it's, I, I'm putting, putting all of this together here. And, and I, I'm using the concept, I guess it's coming to me of a cosmic river. And it's almost like if you focus on helping others, something to do with kindness, with compassion, with healing, and focusing and helping another, no matter what bank of the river you're on, you jump into the same river. And once you're in the river, you're in the river with everyone and everything. I love that, Michael. And that is absolutely it. Because people feel, suddenly they feel this extraordinary sense of oneness. 
And it's so powerful. I mean, when we've done intention experiments, people join in the main online. And yet they talk about physical effects. They talk about unbearable heat or, you know, uh, goosebumps up and down their arms or they cry uncontrollably. Um, they have extraordinary effects. And this happens over and over and over again. As I say, I'm surveying the people who were part of the the inauguration experiment, just as we speak, get the same results all the time. But it is all that about feeling oneness, getting out of your own little sense of separate, alienated separateness. You feel and you experience who we really are. Woohoo! Before we uh, begin to wrap things up and dive into a meditation, since we last spoke, since your book came out, has there been any single epiphany or multiple epiphanies, things that have really struck you that you didn't expect or know back then? There have been loads of epiphanies. And I think probably it has to do with what exactly group effects can do. And one of my favorite stories um, about which was again in our power bank group this year. There was one of the members of the group had a friend whose house was just in the line of the California fires. Yeah. And it was coming, it was just blocks away from her house. And she asked her, this other woman's group to do an intention. And they did to try to protect her house. And what was so fascinating is they didn't discuss it beforehand, but a load of the members of the group had the exact same visualization. They visualized a dome over the woman's house, a dome of protection. And afterward, I kid you not, the first of all, the fire stopped mm -hmm. a block away from her house, went around her house and carried on. And afterward, the firemen found a, literally a dome around it. And what was amazing and the learning that I discovered from this and so many other elements was number one, how quickly we can get into a single mind. Because I thought it was extraordinary that most of the members of the group had exactly the same visualization. Yeah. And as we're working together week by week by week, we do become a hyper brain. I thought that was amazing, but it demonstrated once again, our capacity to heal in an instant. Now I have witnessed this over and over and over and over where a single intention causes an extraordinary miracle, whether it is, you know, Cindy who needed $5,000 and her group does an intention for her and she gets a check from her uncle who she hasn't even heard from for five grand the following week. It was, it is amazing. Or somebody like, um, uh, I think it was Shelly who had, uh, she was struggling. She was addicted to antidepressants uh, depressants, and could not get off of them until her group did an intention for her and she dropped them with no side effects. Normally she had the difficult effects of, of addiction just coming down. She would start feeling really badly. And she was able to do that. So many stories over and over again, or Sam who couldn't even get up. Um, he had such bad chronic fatigue and he's now back working normally. So the big aha for me isn't, other science that I'm reading now yeah. is what I'm witnessing, Michael, over and over again about our latent capacity to heal our lives. And we all know it's there. That's the other thing that I think is amazing is we have this sense of something bigger than this, this body. We all know that, but we just don't really believe it. You know, and we don't know how. And suddenly I'm seeing it manifested over and over and over again. And I continually am the biggest student in the room. I'm still shocked by this. 
Um, but learning more and more about the limits of our own extraordinary capacity to heal our lives. What's cool to me, and then we'll wind things down and get into a meditation here, is that if I go back to Hermeticism, if I go to the Bible and the Torah, if I go to my uh, Jewish and Catholic upbringing, I'll go to the, the, the Jewish side of things, a Jewish boy who was sent to Catholic school, um, but there was this thing called a minion where if you got together 10 people and prayed, or what's interesting, it could be nine people and a Torah. It could be eight people and two Torahs. If you got, <laughs> got a small group together, and certainly going back to the apostles, the 12 apostles, this has been known, and, and you even talk about Stonehenge as a possible group prayer center. This has been known for countless millennia that when you get people together with a common focus, it changes everything. That's absolutely right, Michael. That was that's what I found looking at the power of V. I had to go back to the Bible, to what Jesus was telling the apostles in how to spread the word. He told them to pray homo thumadon, as you mentioned in the beginning, which in the Hellenic Greek means. It's an adverb, meaning passionately with one voice. And basically said, you know, when you do this, this is how you should pray together, passionately with one voice. And when you do, you will heal and you will be healed. And so what we're really harking back to, as you say, is these ancients knew this. And we've forgotten it with our modern science with our sense, with the particularly the neo-Darwinists, you know, that we are just, we are just at the mercy of our genetic material. Well, no, we're far grander than we've been told. And this, I, and the group unleashes these miracles. Woohoo! So on that note, where can people go to find out more, to find out about you? If I understand this right, you have Power of Eight Intention Masterclass, this year-long program coming out. Where can people go to find out about that as well? Okay. So I mentioned the free things that we have available. If people want to study with me and take my course, it kicks off February 6th. You can find out more about it on my website, lynnmctaggart.com or my Facebook page, Lynn McTaggart 2011, under lynnmctaggart.com. Just go under courses and you'll find Power of Eight Intention Masterclass 2021. But hurry, because we're going to kick off February 6th. But yes, we would love to have you. Beautiful, beautiful. On that note, any last words of wisdom that you want to share for people 10xing their intention? And then we're going to dive into, I'm so excited for this meditation. Okay, great. Well, here's my comment. You know, you don't need a sweat lodge. You don't need years of discipline practice. If you want to experience a mystical state, an altered state, or transform your life, all you need is a group of any size and a common intention, and it's your fast track to the miraculous. And this is your birthright. You know, I'm the gatekeeper. This was revealed to me, I, I guess, by, essentially by accident. But this birthright belongs to you and everyone else out there. So find a Power of Eight group and find out for yourself. Woohoo! I, I love how... I, I know we're supposed to wrap up and get into meditation now, but I love tinkering with the inner workings of my guests. And so I'm looking at a former hard-nosed journalist, journalist, actually, you still actually have that inside of you, who's, who's been kind of etch-a-sketched. <laughs> and something else has been completely written, and there's not a darn thing you can do about it. In the most beautiful way. <laughs> no, there is not. I got hijacked. <laughs> I hijacked. I was minding my own business and got hijacked, even from the time of the field. And it became a necessary journey for me to find out more and more and more. And with this stumbling onto the power of V, um, I was 
handed this essentially to tell the world. And that's what I want to do, particularly during these tough times with the lockdown. I know so many people, including myself, have really found my two power of eight groups that I belong to have been extraordinarily strengthening and uplifting during this tough time. So cool. And, and I'm so glad that you were hijacked and have become the vehicle and the vessel that you are. So would you mind guiding us, taking us on a little ride right now into some power of eight intention work? Okay. Well, look, I think we need just a general um, intention. I'm normally much more specific than this, but America needs a little bit of healing. So let's do a little intention just for a few moments to end polarization in America. So let's focus on just Democrats and Republicans. We just have a new president in there and whichever way you voted, you can participate in this. So I want you to take a few deep breaths with me. And we're gonna just again, hold this for just a few moments. So take a deep inhale and a deep exhale. And a deep inhale. And a deep exhale. And deep inhale. And deep exhale. And now on the inhalation. I'd like you to hold the following intention with me. Our intention is that the polarization being experienced in America be immediately, completely, and permanently healed. That Democrats and Republicans come together and work together across the aisle so that there is an end to violence, to rioting, and restoration of peace. Let's take this down to our hearts. And as you do, I want you to visualize the end of any rioting, the end of any violence relating to elections or politics, and it coming together Imagine this now, coming together of both sides of the Congress, working together in harmony. Imagine that, laws being passed, things happening, moving forward, America being healed. Use whatever visualization you want to see to imagine our country coming together in healing and in peace. And let's just hold this together. Allow your mind to have those visualizations wherever they go. And let's hold it together for a few minutes. And as you're doing so, just feel what's going on in your body, the energy in your body coming from other people on this broadcast, intending at the same time. Just feel it and use your five senses as you're sending out that intention. See it, hear it, feel it, taste it, touch it. as you imagine America coming together in peace.
okay, let's go, let go of that intention. Trust the process. And in your own time, come back onto this broadcast. Two thoughts couldn't help but pop up. One, if people are listening to this at different times, time's not real, is it? They'll still get the benefit. Oh, yeah. We have um, people who tune in to my intention experiments later. Um, I've written whole chapters about uh, time travel, uh, retro intention, and all sorts of things, particularly in the intention experiment. So no, in physics, even the even standard physicists say time as we understand it is very different. And lastly, it was interesting as that question popped into my consciousness. First off, as I'm sending love to DC and those in knees and both sides, the room felt like it was getting brighter and brighter. As I went back into the thinking mind, ooh, I've got to ask this question, the light started to dim. And as I brought it back into this LinkedIn meditation, it got brighter again. <laughs> so, so. Amazing. Amazing. So, so cool, Lynn. I cannot thank you enough for being here today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and for all the work you're doing. Thank you so much, Michael. Woohoo! So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the power of eight and begin 10xing your intentions today and shine bright. Woohoo! If you're like me, then this interview with Lynn McTaggart on the power of eight made you happy. I'm so, so happy for this interview. I feel like I got in that river. I got in that flow. I got in that oneness, that unio mystica with everyone. I can't recommend watching this again and again and then getting with your own power of eight group, getting with one of our groups, getting with Lynn McTaggart groups and seeing what can be done. On that note, if you want to plug into the field, if you want to get wisdom from the other side, if you want to find your purpose, your path and your direction, then get Ah, the automatic writing experience. This one book can transform your life by answering the questions. Why am I here? Where am I going? Where do I go? By getting you plugged into the field. So get Ah, you can find it at Amazon. If you want to get or your local booksellers, or if you want the video based program, simply go to automaticwriting.com. On that note, to check out more amazing interviews, click here, subscribe below, be sure to click on the bell icon to be notified of upcoming shows, YouTube premieres, live events with me, and above and beyond all else, shine bright. Woohoo!